today on a new show, which I'm very excited for today's show, for um, our podcast, Brockton to Beacon Hill. And I have a phenomenal guest here with me today that is going to be doing the show with me. And um, I'm just so excited about this because at the State House, this is the summer, and during the summer, we have a lot of interns, which is amazing, phenomenal, talented people that will just come um, to the State House and give their utmost best. They're just phenomenal. And I was even super more lucky because then I had uh, Marcella Rubini, that was my intern pro this summer, and somehow she found me. And it was so amazing because we connected the first time that we saw each other. So when she came for her interview, I surprised her by um, letting her see the governor and also take a picture <laughs> with the governor. And I think she was sold. She was like, yes, that is the person that I want to uh, be able to be working with over the summer. So yeah, I kind of used the governor in the day that we're all gonna be there. I said, like, come see the governor. <laughs> and that was the start in the beginning of amazing, phenomenal work. So today's uh, podcast is really her finals and school. That's what I told her, cause she's been to so many hearings. She's been doing so many great work. And then um, we picked some of the great bills pending over at the State House, some hearings that we attended to and some phenomenal stuff. And she gets to talk all about her experience at the State House. So you know if you are gonna be coming to do an internship program over at the State House, and especially if your representative is Rita Mendes, it may end up in a podcast at the end of um, your program. So you, you love it or you hate it, but we'll, it. Let, we'll let Marcella tell that story. Hello. Well, hi, um, I'm Marcella Rubini. I am the intern for the summer for Representative Mendez. I've been at the State House, but then I also work at her individual office some days. Um, I just graduated undergrad. I'll be going to law school. I'm moving in a week to go to law school in DC, the George Washington University Law School and I'll be studying constitutional law and civil rights. That is amazing. And what did you think about your experience at the State House? Was it what you were expecting when you first came to the State House? Was it not a whole lot or a little bit more? Like how, were you, do you regret it? No, <laughs> no. Um, I didn't really know what to expect, but I think that it was just, it was an amazing experience for me with what I want to do in the future because I want to go into legislation on the federal level and I really wanted to see firsthand what everything looked like on the state level and it was amazing working with you <laughs> because I found you for a reason. I found her, she didn't find me. So, and when she says she didn't know what to expect, I didn't know what to expect either because um, I'm new at the legislation as well at the State House, and everybody is like, all oh, interns, and so many people applying. And I said, well, I have this person that she actually reached out to me, and just phenomenal and amazing. And then when you came in, it was like, yes, she is definitely the one. I know she's going to be amazing, but it mm -hmm. really it superseded my experience, my expectations and everything. Now it's a bittersweet moment for yep. me. It's a tough week because now I need to, you know, you have wings, so mm -hmm. now go fly. <laughs> and I know you're just gonna do so many more amazing things in life, but I'm happy because at least at your beginning, I was there. Mm -hmm. And hopefully I helped in some way Very much. for all the great things that mm -hmm. you're still going to be doing in your life. And I'm so excited for law school. So what is your law school email address so people can let you know <laughs> how you do it, give you a grade, and just like, reach out to you? My law school email address is marcella.rubini at law.gwu.edu. That is exciting. That is uh, phenomenal, and I think you're super prepared for law school. Mm -hmm. And what do you want to study again? Uh, constitutional law and civil rights, so I can work on social justice reform. Perfect. Amazing. So, yes, so now, um, Marcella, mm -hmm. let's get started. Yes. So, what are we talking about today? 
So today um, is our gonna is gonna be our summer podcast to talk about education bills during this legislative session, the 2023-2024 session. And I think it's so important to talk about um, education in particular because when we run for office, we all say uh, we champion education. Mm -hmm. And then once you get in, you find the challenges, you find amazing bills, you find good people that align with you that you want to just get behind them and say, no, this is so amazing. Let's do this together. Let's work on it. So um, the bills that, because this was my assignment to you is to find bills that you think the Brockton community is going to benefit, and especially Brockton public school systems. We've been going through a lot, mm -hmm. especially this year, and um, we're going to be looking at some of these bills and see how amazing, or maybe not so much, it would be if they were to pass and how it would affect the city of Brockton, mm -hmm. either benefit or maybe not, but it, it's it's interesting. I hope that people find it just as useful and powerful as we did, because mm -hmm. this is very important information to share with the community so they know yeah. uh, what is pending before at the State House, and they know that the power that they have, that when we have public hearings that they should come and testify, anybody can come mm -hmm. and testify. We stay at those hearings until eight o'clock, nine o'clock, 10 o'clock at night for hours because we want to make sure that every voice is heard. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to say that a lot because need, people need to know that their voice matters and it's important for them to call their legislature, to send letters, mm -hmm. email, uh, show up for the hearings, show up for rallies, mm -hmm. just really be engaged. And this is why it's important to provide information. So um, you did a phenomenal work. And Thank for you. people that wanted to see the actual slides and the graphics and the amazing stuff that you did that looks so beautiful and professional, <laughs> um, where could they go to see it? They could go to your YouTube channel. Yes, we're going to make sure we'll post it on the YouTube channel. And, state uh, Rep. Mendez. There you go. Thank you for that. State I Rep. Was... Mendez or State Rep. Rita Mendez. Yes, they'll be able to find me on YouTube. Yes. And they'll also be available as a podcast. So, so yes, uh, both ways. So, education it is. Mm -hmm. So, there are countless bills in this legislative session that address the legal rights of students, families, and educators. Yes. And also, um, what I really like is that you have your timeline yes. about talk about your timeline because that was super um, important so prior to diving into the education bills introduced in the Massachusetts legislature for this session we'll take a brief look at the history of education on the state and federal level so in 1635 Boston Latin was founded as America's first public school and then in 1852, Massachusetts actually became the first state to make education compulsory for students aged 8 to 14 years. And then later, in 1954, in the monumental Brown v. Board of Education case decision, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that separate educational facilities are inherently unequal, which I feel like everyone has at least heard of this case mm -hmm. since it was extremely monumental. And then in 1966, that was the beginning of METCO in Massachusetts. METCO, also commonly referred to as busing, is the Metropolitan Council for Education Opportunity, a voluntary desegregation program in which suburban towns enroll students from cities. And the U.S. Supreme Court later ruled in 1974 that busing cannot be required across district boundaries. But then, in 1993, in McDuffie v. Secretary of the Executive Office of Education, the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court ruled that Massachusetts inequities are unconstitutional and the Commonwealth must enact a plan to address them. And then two decades later, in 2010, the legislature passed an act relative to the achievement gap, bringing funding to districts through, Obama, through the Obama administration's Race to the Top competitive grant program in exchange for additional reforms. And now today, School districts across Massachusetts are returning back to this new normal post-COVID-19 pandemic. It was very tough, um, especially for Brockton students. I think students all over the country uh, going through um, mm -hmm. COVID and learning from home and the hybrids or 
schedules of what days of the week you could go to school. Mm -hmm. It really is uh, impressive to see how far we've come and going back to somewhat normal, mm -hmm. we think, but we know that as soon as they miss like crucial timeline being in school, being among other students, and uh, now that they're coming back, maybe you see them acting up, maybe you see them not really knowing how to behave or showing in people like what is going on. But these kids, they will literally lock up in their apartments or their house or their places for entire school year. And again, and COVID and the scare and all information changing every day. So it's normal, mm -hmm. even for adults. Adults started acting a little bit concerned. Imagine for children what it is to their mental health. Mm -hmm. And now all of that that we have to yeah. making sure we're providing them with resources so they can continue to thrive, even though they miss crucial moments in their education mm -hmm. system. But it's a, a great timeline. I think it's so important because it talks about uh, the Boston Latin being the first public school in the entire United States. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. That way, yeah. I did not know that prior to reading this whole education timeline and book that you gave me. I did. That's what I did. <laughs> I, I actually gave you assignments. <laughs> and I was just like, this is information, the resources, these are the hearings. Mm -hmm. Go to them, summarize them, familiarize yourself with them, and then let's tell the people yep. what you've learned. And I just think you just excel in every way. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then we have some bills that are pending now at the Massachusetts House of Representatives and also the Senate. Yes and that we're gonna be talking a little bit about them today and see where do they stand. Mm -hmm. I believe most of them are still in committee. I don't think we've, start, next year we'll see more progress but it's being recommended favorably, but for this year it's still sort of a beginning of the session. Yep. So the bills are still in committee, which means that if people like these bills and they think it's important to pass, they can still send in letters of support, even if the public comment period has expired. They can still um, send letters of support to the members of the Education Committee mm -hmm. and the chairs and let them know, they call the legislature to support, yeah. to still sponsor the bills, there's still time for that. So it's a crucial timing, especially school system is starting for the fall pretty soon, yeah. as you know. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna be heading over to school uh, to get you going. So it's, it's the perfect timing to be talking about education. Definitely. There's so many education bills in this 2023-2024 session that address equity, representation, penalties, and more. And so we can only talk about so many today, but there are very many more if you want to go on mass.gov to look at all of the bills, if you have time, if you want to. But we'll start. And that's important because people need to know this is not the full list, it's not mm -hmm. even close. But obviously we have limited time and we're just starting really scratching the surface we're not yep. even going in so we're really letting people know what it's there and then obviously if they have questions they can reach out i'll give my information at the end to be calling reaching out emailing and we it's a partnership we work together with the community mm -hmm. and dive in more into um, these bills and they can also follow us online we put a lot of the hearings and the bills and things that it's important for the community to know. So we'll give all that information at the end. Yes. So starting with all the bills, we first have Senate Bill 343 and House Bill 530. They're both an act establishing an education to career data center. As Massachusetts makes unprecedented investments to close equity gaps and respond to an intense worker shortage, the demand for high quality data that informs policy decisions is increased. So states around the US are crafting legislation to get the most from their education to career data systems while also safeguarding personal privacy. This legislation will make Massachusetts a national leader. Policymakers, researchers, and the public will gain access to invaluable education to career data. So let's talk about who this bill helps. Education to career data systems benefit everyone. They benefit educators in workforce development, practitioners delivering direct instruction, students and families making decisions about their futures, state and local officials responsible for establishing policy and allocating limited resources, 
agency staff working to fulfill data requests for legislators, researchers, and private citizens. And so basically it helps a lot of people. Yes, and what I do like is um, a lot of time, I know you are going into law school and you definitely um, should, amazing, but we also look into the vocational schools because mm -hmm. that provides people, because some of our students maybe they're not ready to go to a four-year college or they're not ready to go, you know, graduate school or they, they really want to just get to the workforce mm -hmm. and making sure they have a profession that pays well, that they can join a union, that they can start making decent money. I do think we are lacking in providing actual career skills, actual mm -hmm. life skills, actual providing them, okay, you want to go to different careers, whatever that may be, whether it's going to law school or medical school or these other things that require more education definitely empower those kids to do that mm -hmm. but for others that want to get a well decent paying job living wages and being able to join a union and have insurance and have protection and being able to provide for their families without the cost we were talking about the cost of education mm -hmm. and the bills and the student loans, yep. and the books, and the prices. We were literally yeah. talking about that. So all of that adding up, we need to provide resources to our students to whatever direction they feel more comfortable that they're going to go mm -hmm. and excel. And we're here uh, at the BCA studio today, and it's so important because they're doing the summer training for the kids that are learning to do the video editing, they're learning actual life skills. And we were just talking mm -hmm. about that as we came in, see how crucial that is in today's day and age to have the children learn uh, the computer skills, the filming, the photography, the editing, mm -hmm. the labor's work that it's like editing videos, editing podcasts. So these things, we need to be more mindful. What is happening today in our society? Where are the needs are leading to, whether it's the social media marketing, uh, whether it is things that are, are modern, current, that it's in need to mm -hmm. now. And we don't have a big workforce in those areas because it's just so new, mm -hmm. it's just so evolving. So as legislators, we have to always look um, how can we empower the next generation to take on the workforce in whatever field that they know that that's what they want to do and empower them, give them the resources, the tools and things um, to, to allow them to excel. So I think we have to have uh, the responsibility to look into that and be mindful, mm -hmm. be creative. Careers in technology and computer science now are so abundant. There's actually another bill that we didn't, we don't have the chance to talk about really today, but it's, um, it introduces more computer science coursework and that would really help students excel when there's many, not me personally, I'm not very good with computer science, but there's a lot of students who aren't getting the education on what they are just innately good at. Mm -hmm. And computer science is one of those things that some people are geniuses with and I don't understand at all how, but we need more course coursework to support all students and give them all a chance to have a successful career. Exactly. And that is vital. Yes. Well, so back to the bill. Yes. <laughs> um, in regards to what this bill does, it establishes a mission and a vision for a centralized education to career data system that charts transitions from early education to K through 12, higher education and into the workforce. It provides a legal framework for cross agency data sharing by creating an office and governing board to oversee the use of these data and safeguard information to protect individual privacy. And now it also develops protocols for evaluating strategic initiatives and exchanging state data with local research practice partnerships. So, yes. Um, so we also have the section regarding um, who does this bill like helps mm -hmm. and who does this bill does not help. So we have a focus here 
to the community, the students in Brockton, mm -hmm. obviously is um, we we want to see we want to see students drive all yes. over. But I represent the city of champions, <laughs> <laughs> so would you feel that this would be something that would definitely benefit the city of Brockton and our school system and its students and mm -hmm. great definitely yes <laughs> absolutely so and that's the exciting thing of this job is that we can do things that we know uh, in champion bills or stand behind them that we know it's going to directly benefit our community mm -hmm. and that really wakes us up in the morning be yep. like okay we can change lives today um, we just worked on our budget. Mm -hmm. I will refrain from speaking about the budget today because we will be doing another podcast on the budget at a later day. Stay tuned. Yes, but it is it is exciting. Mm -hmm. It was like mesmer. I was just so happy and so like okay. Mm -hmm. I said it is good to be here doing good things for the community, mm -hmm. and that's why we talk about these bills because we just think it's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. All right, so so. Then Next bill, um, we have Senate Bill 256 and House Bill 592. They are an act to create and expand student pathways to success. So it kind of goes into the previous bill that we just talked about. Um, so this bill, it codifies the Workforce Skills Cabinet and charge it, charges it with pathways, governance duties, including alignment and equity of access. So I know that's kind of a jumble of words, but um, the Workforce Skills Cabinet is something that so many different organizations have put together and worked on and um, it just it goes and helps students to really discover what careers are available to them because sometimes it seems like there's only five options when there's really like five million options there's so many career paths that we don't know about and if we have workforce skills cabinet and all these other programs that are introduced in these bills well so, um, I have a 17 year old. Yeah. <laughs> that is hopefully going to be going to college. Uh, so, the fall, he starts senior year. Mm -hmm. You probably know better than I do. I remember <laughs> I get it wrong and he yells at me. But, okay, so he's going to be senior now. And then that's the million dollar question. Yeah. So, what would you like to do? Where do you want to go for school? And, and all these options. And that's exactly what he tells me. Like, he goes, I don't know, but it's like you should know. Yeah. You're always there, so it's like you're behind. So it freaks me out. Mm -hmm. I know that at so obviously, hopefully, the light bulb will go on and goes like, this is what I definitely want to do. But this would be so crucial, yeah. and especially not leaving it for the senior year, but you know, earlier on. So mm -hmm. that way, you already know hopefully I have an sooner idea. rather than later so you can do an internship like you did it at the state house so you um throughout your high school years like do an internship in mm -hmm. that field just so you can be super sure because mm -hmm. it's expensive to go to school to go yeah. to college and if you just start and decide um, that that is not what you like that you completely hate it then just start over at another career path it takes a lot longer, it costs money, it just makes you give up completely mm -hmm. because like maybe school is just not for me and I'm a disaster, I'm not doing it. So it puts all these traumas on the child and the children that it doesn't need to be that way. We can provide them resources so they can find out earlier and then they can start investigating, learning more, talking to people in that field and then maybe like uh, i don't know if i want to invest so much time in studying mm -hmm. or i don't know if i really am that great in math so that may be challenging for me maybe another area that is somewhat similar to that but not doesn't require as much intensity with this and maybe i can just do that and just see see start making money see how that goes and then from there there's so many options mm -hmm. like you said and we need to provide them options because it's our future yeah. We want to make sure that these kids are going to be the future representatives, the future leaders of this country. So mm -hmm. it's our job to provide them with the resources now so they can excel exactly. above and beyond and use their talent and creativity mm -hmm. to just go far. It's not even just the fact that we need opportunities to be available, but also people like students and youth need to be informed of these opportunities. 
And if they're out there and nobody knows about it, then they can't actually go for it. Exactly. And mm -hmm. it comes out that at some point there's going to be a shortage in that mm -hmm. field because people are not really the reaching out to the students. So, yeah, yeah this is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> well, so more on this bill. Um, it also incentivizes the awarding of industry-recognized credentials, the After Dark program, and employability skills. It has sustainable funding for pathways. It has um, Chapter 74 in comprehensive high schools. It has MICAP, Mass Corps, computer science like we were talking about. It has pathways governance with DESI, with, which is the Department of Education and Secondary Education. And it removes barriers to participating in work-based learning, which is so important. Yes. Phenomenal. Do you think Brockton kids would benefit from this? 100%. Awesome. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, not just Brockton kids, you yeah. know, the, our entire school system. But yep. yeah. All right. So the next bill is House Bill 444, and it's an act to expand the use of career and academic plans. This bill would amend Section 1, Chapter 71 of the Mass General Laws by adding two new sections. So this bill. It would say that all public school districts shall ensure that all high school students beginning in the ninth grade have developed with the support of a designated educator and an online platform approved by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, an individual learning plan, all students. And so nothing in this act will prevent districts from, be from beginning the process of having students develop individual learning plans prior to beginning high school for students in their jurisdictions. So good that you're talking about individual learning plan because mm -hmm. when we think about that we think about um, some students that have some learning disabilities that needs uh, that IEP yes <laughs> IEP exactly four, four, 504 plans right and it may make the students feel uh, special but a little bit different from the others because they have their more personalized plan for them but mm -hmm. maybe their friends at schools uh, don't. This really takes away all of that. We, Each child will have their own individual learning plan. We're mm -hmm. all um, special and unique in their own way and they'll be able to excel in their own career path. Mm -hmm. And that is really the job of education to um, see the struggles but also the talents in each and just provide them with a bunch of resources and leading them to the right path and making sure that dropouts is unheard of mm -hmm. and that they can at least get the full uh, graduation for high school and also hopefully leave with a career or go to a, um, undergrad and graduate school see them excel, to mm -hmm. see them doing well. And this is the beginning. Yep. Yeah. So more about this bill. Um, districts shall report annually to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education on their progress in meeting these requirements. So the Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed shall develop guidance for districts to oversee and ensure their compliance with the provisions of this section. And Section 1 shall take effect for the school year beginning after July 1st, 2026. So this is looking pretty far into the future, but it's never too early to start. And especially with these bills and how long it takes to get them passed and how so many bills are killed or and also, rated for unfavorably. Or exactly. And also, uh, we will look at the cost, how much it would be costing each um, school system and... It gives time for each school system to prepare mm -hmm. and gives time for DESI to um, really go in more deep into this and, and define what this all would mean. Yeah. This individual learning plan, how would it actually uh, take an effect and, and be in practicality. Yeah. But it's definitely something worth looking into mm -hmm. because if we just leave it as it is, it's a decent. But if we can excel, if we can do better, then we should. Yep. Exactly. Uh, and especially for um, children that English is not their first language mm -hmm. and that they are on ESL, uh, language, uh, English as a second language, or their parents don't speak English, or they're struggling even because of that language barrier, mm -hmm. that would really allow them to 
um, excel because you're recognizing you're providing that individual learning plan for yeah. each child as they progress with the English language as they uh, leave because a lot of times they'll start in that bilingual system and they are sort of forgotten in there mm -hmm. because it's just comfortable it's harder to get them out of their comfort zone and put them in the mainstream and where yep. they're going to be everybody just speaking in english what if i don't know english that mm -hmm. well what if i can't keep up what if then you're just like all those fears so you just read there but then you could be graduating from high school and still your english proficiency may not all be there mm -hmm. because you did your career in that bilingual system and now you have to really uh, rely on your English abilities and maybe you're not that confident even though you graduated from a high school in the United States yeah and you're still feeling that you're not as strong with the English language mm -hmm. so this would really allow them to see you're doing great you're doing just fine you'll be doing great even more in these uh, classes that even though it's just gonna be all in English you can do it because yep. you're there you're ready mm -hmm. so I think it empowers them in that sense as well otherwise it's just easier to be oh you're in the bilingual system you want to stay there okay stay there for another year oh you want to continue okay mm -hmm. I just think that yeah the yeah. individual learning programs too they it's not one shoe fits all, one size fits all, whatever that expression is. Individual learning programs would give each student a platform, a place, a, an educator, just a way to learn in the way that is most suitable to them. Exactly. Would that benefit Brockton students? Definitely. <laughs> Very much so. I thought so. Nice <laughs> move on. Okay. So next up is Bill H549, which is an act relative to educator diversity. So as you can see on the infographics that we have in the presentation, if you go, if you're listening to this podcast, you can go onto our YouTube and you can take a look at the slides if you want to see. They're pretty colorful. I made them myself. Mm -hmm. But so in promoting this bill, an act for educator diversity, as well as another bill that goes hand in hand with H549, we need to emphasize that having teachers who are representative of the student body is pertinent to student success and achievement. The San Diego Foundation shows us how true this assertion is by pointing to academic evidence. And I quote, according to research by John Hopkins University, black students who had just one black teacher by the third grade were 13% more likely to enroll in college. And those who had had two were 32% more likely. Okay, okay, okay. Say that again. I don't think we heard that correctly. <laughs> so black students who had just one black teacher by the third grade were 13% more likely to enroll in college. And those who had two were 32% more likely to enroll in college. Is that Marcella saying? Nope. That was the San Diego Foundation. Isn't that impressive? Yeah. It really is. It's mind blowing. It just amazes me. Um, I've been doing a lot of tours at our um, Brockton Public Schools and I'm fascinated about the times that I get to talk to the students and I tell them a little bit about my story because mm -hmm. you know, I also came, no English, and then when they hear that today I'm an attorney and I am a counselor at large finishing my term yep. and also a state representative their eyes literally it lit up mm -hmm. and their faces and their shock and their open it's just like amazing to see the expression mm -hmm. and they at a lot of times are in disbelief that i actually um, speak another language other than english that english is not my first language that mm -hmm. i speak portuguese and they're asking me so what language do you speak at home i was like trust me my husband's English is, is <laughs> it's okay, but it, it's, it's like a broken English. I definitely speak Portuguese at home. So they want to talk to me in Portuguese as to make sure that that is real, mm -hmm. to, for them to believe. And then I tell them, I said, you're here. You're in the U.S. You're learning. You're in the land of opportunities. You can go and do so much more. Mm -hmm. 
and and that really gives them hope. And I also bring them. We've been there with me at the state house. They love mm -hmm. the tour. Get to meet the governor. A lot of them, they're new to the United States, don't really speak English, and they are so shocked. They're like, "Our governor is a woman. That's so amazing." Mm -hmm. They didn't even know, and they are there with our Massachusetts governor, and they're like taking pictures. How amazing is that? Yeah. And we even had a student who was trying to pass a law because she just uh, saw the pulpit and then that microphone, and she was saying it in Portuguese. So what is the law you want to pass? Oh, we're only going to have classes two days a week. <laughs> <laughs> but at least like they're playing with it yes. they're seeing themselves doing it they're they're having fun mm -hmm. it's real it's like that palace and they're just walking in that palace and they're saying it's real i'm here this land of opportunity we can do so many great things so yeah i just had to stop you yeah there. <laughs> no it's true being able to visually and realistically imagine and see oneself in a certain role in a certain career path, in a certain position of power and influence has more impact on youth than many of us realize. So for so many reasons, representation is vital. Yes. And so in regards to the Brockton Public School District, the blatant disparity in racial representation within Brockton Public Schools is evident in the student to educator, or to educator ratio. So as of the 2022-2023 school year, 80% of students in the district are black or Latino. Meanwhile, only 23% of full-time educators in the district are black or Latino. Representation matters. Data speaks volumes and the 67% gap is loud. Yes, and especially this year, mm -hmm. the um, school committee has been very busy Parents have been coming to speak up at those meetings because obviously we've all heard about the layoffs. Mm -hmm. And what happens is that this, I guess we'll talk about it in the next bill. I'm like trying to Yeah, the playing. layoffs are the next bill. This is getting people, <laughs> yes, educators who yes, represent the student I, body to the table. Yes, sounds good. We'll, we'll just wait. You're getting ahead of yourself. <laughs> Go ahead. You can talk about, you can talk about the, okay. um, the, the the gap. We've talked about it. Um, how important it is yeah. for the students to see themselves. Um, it, it sees a possibility. So representation does matter, yeah. and that is why I ran. I really feel it's important to. Uh, be that voice for the voiceless. That's why I chose to do immigration law. I really think it's important to have people that have gone through the process know how stressful and how your life really depends on it. You're here, you're waiting to hear things. You just want to do the right thing mm -hmm. and have someone that genuinely cares and not obviously for um, the money because if I was going to law school just to be this famous rich attorney. I've been doing criminal law, mm -hmm. uh, personal injury, workers' compensation, <laughs> and all these other great stuff. Contracts. That makes so much more money and less stress yeah. and not as intense, not as involved. But you have to make a decision, I guess, at some point in your life. If making money the most that you can make important to you, go for it. Mm -hmm. Because that is what is going to satisfy you. That's what you want to go for. Absolutely, you should definitely go for it. Or if making impacts and changing people's life your um, important goal, yeah. then that is also what you should be doing. Because, because if your goal is to make an impact in people's lives and definitely change people's lives and work in like a social work job, and you're um, seeking just money because you want to please your family or you want to just have that status, you'll be so unhappy. So whatever makes you happy, and I'm just genuinely happy being there at the State House. The amazing stuff, mm -hmm. though, we're not going to talk about the budget today, <laughs> and I was so happy about amazing stuff. I guess I can talk about the universal free school meals for yes. kids since we talk about education mm -hmm. maybe you'll allow me to talk about that that was so amazing uh, and then in state tuition <laughs> for our immigrant kids that we also <laughs> got to pass so hopefully the governor will sign 
uh, the budget, but it's just amazing stuff. And that really puts that fire in uh, my belly is still like growling every day. Mm -hmm. Like, this is so amazing. We got to change people's lives, directly impact people's lives and make a difference and change. And I get to be yep. here and being a part of it, mm -hmm. being a part of history for the better, making a difference. And they can never erase me from history because now I'm in the books. Yep. And it's like super cool. Mm -hmm. Who would ever think someone from another country coming to this country Given you know the public education system, taking the most out of it, being able to go to school, community college, and all of that, and now be sitting at the table mm -hmm. where I can truly work with my colleagues and advocate and working with groups that are really working hard to pass these amazing bills and directly impact and change people's lives. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I will let you continue the timeline. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So for a brief overview of this bill's advancement through the many channels of the Massachusetts legislature, we have a timeline from January 2023 to July 2023. So this timeline is representative of the process which most bills go through before being formally voted on in chambers. And so this timeline, it's available on our YouTube because we have all the slides on there. Um, but if you want to explain a little bit. Yes, and I think it's important because um, people still have time. Mm -hmm. And until they get uh, voted, hopefully favorably, uh, by the committee on education, people can still um, send in letters, call the legislators, mm -hmm. leave them a message, the chairs and the members of the education committee, definitely reach out. Definitely let people know this is important, so there's still time. Maybe they're like, oh, there's a hearing on it, and I didn't uh, participate on the public hearing, so I am screwed, I missed my opportunity, my just No, we're talking to you because it's still pending. Yep. We want to make sure it gets voted favorably uh, by the Education Committee. So use your voice, mm -hmm. speak up, and just let us know, let the Education Committee know how would that change the city of Brockton? How would that change um, the students' lives? How would that really make a positive impact? So that is uh, why it's important to have this timeline. And a lot of times people say, oh, it takes forever to pass a bill on uh, Beacon Hill. Mm -hmm. It is important that we um, allow the time for the public hearings. It is important that we allow the time for public comments. It is important that we allow the time to uh, really debate this. But when there's a public push, that could speed things up. Mm -hmm. That could ensure that maybe we can pass it in this session. Yep. Because that would be ideal. So by July of next year, mm -hmm. and exactly at the end of the session, which uh, was this past July for the first um, term session, then next year, the end of July, be celebrating the passage of this bill. Mm -hmm. But we can't do it alone. We definitely need yeah. people to speak up. And that's the number one message for today mm -hmm. is these things that we're talking about, we can still, we want to hear from the community. Mm -hmm. That's important. I know it sounds like when you say call your legislators, it sounds like what does that really do as an individual? But I mean, I know because Every time I see a post that says, call your legislators, it seems like, what is my voice going to do? But when so many people in your community call your legislators and urge them to vote favorably or support or sponsor a certain bill that directly affects your community, the they goes, listen. Yeah. They have to listen because mm -hmm. we are here to represent the community. So when we have people from our district paying attention, calling, reaching out, sending emails, we got one, we're like, okay, five, oh, ten. It's already enough to call attention. But like, this, unfortunately to say, it's not even ten people that will call and say. But when you got like ten, fifteen, twenty, you're like, oh, I've got all these people <laughs> calling. So you be uh, going over to the mm -hmm. the chair of the committee, be like. Where is that going? Because uh, my people want to know the people that I represent, that I were put here, I was put here to represent. They want to know, and I have to have to tell them something. Mm -hmm. So they were like, "Okay, 
everybody is getting these calls. This is something that we should definitely take a look at. There's a lot of bills pending on Beacon Hill. A mm -hmm. lot of them will not get attention. A lot of them will not, most of them will not pass. So in order for us to put attention on the bills that really matter to us, we have to make the work. Mm -hmm. And it's in partnership. We have to make the work. Definitely call, definitely reach out, definitely send letters, definitely reach out to the Committee on Education. Use your voice. The next bill. Yes, I was going to say. exciting bill. Yep. <laughs> so in correlation with House Bill 549, this House Bill 583 addresses the necessity for a diverse educator workforce. However, while 549 gets educators to the table, this bill works to keep them there. Perfect. Now, now, before we start talking about uh, this bill, yep. we're going to hear the actual testimony uh, at the public hearing at the Education Committee, Yay. which it was by the people that actually, the senator and the representative that actually filed the bill, which is Senator Payano and Representative um, Priscilla Souza. Mm -hmm. And since Brockton is such a perfect example where this is affecting the city of Brockton right now, mm -hmm. today, I was also on that <laughs> <laughs> testimony and that hearing so people get to hear directly of what happened and then we'll go over the bill okay. a little bit. Hello. À, xin, à, xin chào, tôi tên là Kelly Lu. Thank Ngôn you very tính. much. Hi, this is the interpreter. Sure if you want, I can... In looks forward to working with you. Oh. Th uh, thank you, uh, Chair Garlic, Chair Lutis, and uh, members of the committee uh, for granting us the opportunity of speaking uh, and testifying uh, before you today on Senate Bill uh, uh, 340 and House Bill 583. Uh, it is with... Uh, great passion and energy that I, I stand before you uh, advocating for a change that I think is going to enable our state to have an educator workforce that truly reflects the diversity of our human population. Uh, right now, we're facing a very stark reality. Uh, according to DESI, 44% of our public school system um, identify as students of color, yet uh, only around 10%. Clearing disparity that has to be addressed if we're uh, going to foster an inclusive and equitable uh, learning in environment. Um, you know, I, I can the data already shows that uh, if uh, a student has uh, a student of color has uh, other teachers that um, uh, BIPOC teachers that they do better. Uh, but this data is something that I, I can tell you, tell you personally, as have, having some I've gone through the public school system uh, that it, it was. Uh, the te some of the teachers that were important in my life uh, were teachers that were similar to myself and understood my culture, understood uh, what I was going through. Uh, both my parents were, uh, my mom's still a teacher, 30 years uh, at the end of the year. And, uh, you know, there, there, there isn't a month that goes by where a student, come, a former student comes up to me and talks to me about uh, why they love my parents so much. And it always is connected with like, they understood what I was going through. Uh, you know, I'm in college because they knew that my family wanted me to be working and they were able to help me um, uh, essentially uh, create a pathway to college and talk to my family about that. And our state has taken, you know, some really great steps uh, to diversify our educator workforce. Uh, but the reality is that many teachers of color are still in the early stages of their career. Uh, in mass, teachers of color are more than twice as likely as white teachers to be in the first few years of the professional journey. Uh, this is a critical issue because our state law re relies currently on a senior-based approach when making layoff decisions. Without achieving professional status, which as many of you know, uh, requires three years of service in the same district, uh, these dedicated young, um, young uh, teachers uh, would be the first to face layoffs. And it's an alarming situation because right now, considering the, the recent decline of over 4% in public school enrollments in 2019, uh, coupled with the impending expiration of uh, federal lease funds this year, uh, you know, signs, of, you know, potentially could point to uh, to layoffs. And uh, if we continue to fully rely on seniority, uh, uh, BIPOC teachers are going to be disproportionately at risk. 
Uh, the purpose of these bills is to address this urgent matter by updating the law to safeguard the diversity of our state teaching workforce and ensure that hard to staff schools and subjects have qualified teachers. Uh, the bill proposes a, a crucial modification to state law where school districts would uh, consider additional criteria beyond seniority when making layoff decisions. Uh, I, I believe that uh, these, uh, including these uh, criteria, would be a significant stride to closing the gap between the numbers of students uh, and teachers of color. I think it's imperative that we embrace this le legislative change, recognizing the immense value and potential of a diverse uh, educator workforce. And by doing so, not only do we provide equitable opportunities for students, uh, but also we create a more inclusive and enriched uh, learning environment for all. Uh, thank you, uh, members of uh, for the committee, for uh, for your time. Thank you so much to the chairs, um, to the vice chair and the rest of the committee for taking us out of order. Um, we, I'm here to testify on House Bill 583 and Senate um, Bill 340. Um, <clears throat> in my community, I serve as, in my other life uh, municipally, I serve as the chair of the Framingham School Committee. Um, I am the first woman of color to occupy this role, and I take every opportunity I can to be inside the classroom because representation matters. Having someone invested in education that understands your personal experience matters. Um, there's countless research on it. And I serve in this role in the district where over 50% of the population um, identify, speaks some sort of la other language at home um, and, or identifies as non-white. Here in Massachusetts, as Senator Payano said, Roughly 44% of our student populations finds themselves in the same situation. And even by the most generous of estimates, 12% of our teachers are able to represent um, this group. Despite um, measures like recent investments uh, towards uh, diverse ed educator recruitment, emergency licensure during COVID and other measures, a teaching population that represents a student population is far from a reality. It just is. And worse yet, it's under threat. Minority teachers today go through a tremendous amount of challenges such as exclusion, being passed on for opportunities or burnout from having to go above and beyond their roles today to truly represent their students um, and sometimes even translate uh, when, or, where others can't. Almost half of Latino teachers today leave the profession within four years for reasons like the ones mentioned and invidious layoff policies. Um, that dictate that last hires are the first ones to go. So the teachers that all these efforts um, to make our classroom more inclusive and representative is constantly under threat. We cannot continue layoff policies um, as they are without risking what little representation we have in the classroom. So I ask that the committee vote favorably on um, these bills to reevaluate teacher layoffs and bring cultural competency and language proficiency into the conversation. This isn't a what if issue, it's happening today, it's happening in Brockton. Um, and we cannot protect representation in the classroom unless we acknowledge it. Thank you. Thank you so much for um, the committee for hearing me. So I'm Rita Mendez and I'm also um, counsel at large in the city of Brockton, finishing up my term this year. But uh, as a, a representative, what I've been doing as my goal has been um, doing a tour at our school systems and um, just talking to the students, sharing them a little bit of my story that I also came to this country without speaking English and relied on the public education system, just telling them a little bit about me. And you see their eyes literally in shock just because they see someone that looks like them um, and they still, they ask me, so what language do you speak at home? And I tell them uh, we speak Portuguese and my husband really doesn't speak English and they still don't believe me. They ask me to speak Portuguese with them because they're in shock that someone like them can go on in life and become an attorney, become a representative or a counselor, be engaged in their city and their committee. So that really shows that representation does matter. And the issue in Brockton is that the majority of um, the school system, the teachers are not uh, minorities. They are not even from the city of Brockton. And we made a huge effort to bring in these minority teachers that speak another language that from the city of Brockton understands the culture, understands what they're going through at home, 
the difficulty that their parents have multiple jobs can really help the children as much. So they do that extra effort. And now, because of the lack of the enrollments, which for $18 million, which is causing 130 teachers being laid off, guess who are the teachers that are getting laid off in Brockton? These teachers that are making the efforts, the minorities, the ones that just got hired, uh, around during the pandemic time. So they're being let go and they're not going to another school system to try to get another job. As a teacher, they're going to different field or maybe saying that the school department is, is not for them teaching as much as they love and what they're going through and getting their certifications. Because the first opportunity, you know, there's no money, they're the first ones going out. So they don't see that respect or appreciation that for them. So I really urge the committee to take a deeper look into this because it's a problem that I know Brockton is the first one that we're seeing it probably after the pandemic, these huge declines, but it's going to continue to happen. And these kids, they do need to see that they can also go on in life and do greater things and they can only see themselves if they can uh, identify with the people that are there teaching them. And um, so I'm, I'm really passionate uh, about this. And I really hope that agora. you um, pass this favorably. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Now that you got you here. Yes. The public hearing testimony, which is so powerful. Mm -hmm. Now we can talk about it. Exactly. Let's talk about it now. Okay. So House Bill 583 acts in a way similar to teachers' unions in that it works to protect educators' jobs. Once we have teachers who are representative of their student body, we need to help them stay there. According to the U.S. Department of Education, the rate of teachers of color leaving the teaching profession is significantly higher than that of white teachers with an annual turnover rate of 45%. And let's not forget about the national and statewide wage gap between white workers and workers of color. So House Bill 583 states for one example that in a layoff, a teacher with language proficiency or fluency in accordance with um, language demographics in their district will be prioritized in a layoff if that teacher's layoff will result in a lower ratio of students with said language as their first language and staff fluent slash proficient in that language. And so this is really important, especially in Brockton, um, because as of 2021, 46.8% of Brockton's population speaks a language other than English in the home. And so this bill would directly make sure that educators who are representative in terms of language, especially, of their student body and making sure that not just the students or the educators get their jobs and get the jobs that they deserve, but to make sure that they are some of the ones who stay at the school in light of a layoff. Yes. Um, and it, this is really so powerful on so many levels because it's one thing to retain um, the educator diversity mm -hmm. that people that students can feel and see themselves represented and in being empowered by that it's another whole thing to ensure that we get to keep them because as it is now the first the last one to get hired is usually the first one out the door when there's a layoff mm -hmm. and that is a problem because we're working so hard to hire uh, the diversity, and then when it comes time to lay off, they're the first ones out the door, and they're not usually the ones staying in education. Mm -hmm. They're probably going to other career paths, and that is a problem. We want to hire them, and we want to retain them. Mm -hmm. So, yep. Last hired, first fired. Yeah, which is 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 needs to be looked at and in a different lenses yeah. because it, it's definitely, um, it definitely needs improvement mm -hmm. in that area. So, absolutely. 45% turnover rate nationally is insane. Much so. And then you have some um, information from the U.S. Department of Education. Yes. Which I, it's, it's like, 
Go ahead. So in the words of the United States Department of Education, as a majority of the teacher population is currently white, it is important to understand how these teachers can successfully teach our diverse student population. Researchers have identified four challenges to selecting and teaching culturally relevant subject matter. One, resistance. Two, limited view of culture. Three, lack of knowledge of students' cultures and identities. And then four, lack of opportunity for students to develop critical consciousness. And so again, according to the United States Department of Education, minority group teachers tend to have a greater sense of how to develop and therefore enact culturally relevant curriculums. The DOE also asserts that schooling in the context of making a real difference in students' lives can serve as a catalyst for minority group people to enter the profession as well as help retain those who already work there. This assertion by the U.S. Department of Education emphasizes the vitality of having a diverse educator workforce. So although representation is essential, this is not only about representation at face value. Studies show that having educators and mentors who are capable of creating culturally relevant curriculums, of relating to their students, of communicating with their students and mentees, and who instill an image and an affirmation in the minds of students that someone who looks like, speak like speaks like, or simply is like them in some regard is vital to student growth and achievement. And this is all according to the U.S. Department of Education. Exactly. So my Procton friends, family, friends, colleagues, everybody, definitely reach out. Let, uh, let's work on these uh, important bills, especially as it deals with education, with diversity, and how that would greatly benefit our students. I just think that it's uh, amazing that we start looking at other factors. Unfortunately, when layoff is inevitable, we don't want to lay off mm -hmm. any teachers, but definitely looking at other things really makes a difference. And it, it's, it's proven. <laughs> Yeah, mm -hmm. so we got the data there to tell us uh, how crucial this is. So, yeah, next bill. So I could talk about this one for a while. But <laughs> so the next two bills we're just going to briefly mention Perfect. because we don't have too much time and we have yes. a lot of bills. Um, but H 1286 or 1286 proposes an act relative to high schools providing and funding college programs. Um, I like this one a lot. Yeah. I will of course. <laughs> not talk about it so much because I did speak a little bit about this on a previous um, podcast, but I did file a bill uh, for the Brockton kids to be able to attend um, Massasoit free of charge, mm -hmm. um, especially community colleges. I do believe and it should be mm -hmm. uh, free, and I know the governor uh, is pushing and we just pass it in the house, but I will refrain from talking about the budget uh, for the, um, the people that are 25 and older to be able to have the free community college for the workforce and all these amazing things that we've been talking about. So I am happy that the mayor's in favor, school committee members, and we got the support from the city. And I do think we're, we're seeing, we're seeing momentum in this area, mm -hmm. pushing for it and getting through it. I'm just excited. I know you keep mentioning the budget and I know we're going to talk ah. about the budget in the next podcast, but I just wanted to mention that although budgeting and the budget and finances, that all sounds pretty boring unless you're a finance money person, but in reality, the budget is what allocates resources to the right places and gets funding and money and opportunity to the communities that need them. And so That's there is a, really exciting stuff going on with so the budget. We're so excited, <laughs> but I'm refraining to stay tuned. <laughs> okay, so the next bill that we're going to briefly mention is H515, 515, an act to ensure education rights are upheld for incarcerated youth. So this bill, we heard <laughs> there's so many um, different hearings that really changes you. And I wish we had unlimited time so we could talk about all these amazing things. Mm -hmm. But we actually heard from people that are detained in our jails and just hearing how some of these bills directly impact them and hearing directly from the people that are mostly affected by it it's just powerful. Mm -hmm. And this is just, uh, we want to make sure that even though they're incarcerated, that they can be 
back in society with the profession, with the career, uh, and be members of society working towards um, making their lives better. Mm -hmm. We're not preparing them, we're just leaving them out there without any resources. They're just gonna go back to their old ways and that will not change in behavior. Mm -hmm. A quality education is so important for that. Absolutely, even if you happen to be incarcerated. Mm -hmm. so. And education is a human right. Thank it's you. It's not a privilege. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Well said. So next up, H476 is an act providing for alternative penalties for failure to send children to school. So this act addresses the penalties against parents and guardians due to chronic absenteeism, also known as truancy, among youth in the state of Massachusetts. <laughs> I like this one a lot because mm -hmm. you may not think that um, children don't go to school. You just assume that they do. Mm -hmm. That doesn't always necessarily is the case. Mm -hmm. So when that is the case, then we need to take it um, more serious steps towards it. So. Mm -hmm. so this bill would assist the families of students in question, students themselves, and low-income families across the Commonwealth. Families who cannot afford fines are currently punished for their economic inability. When youth experience chronic absenteeism, often as a result of financial need, these fines only make matters worse. Students are financially dependent and suffer when their family is facing economic hardship. Decriminalization of low-income status is a human and civil rights movement that seeks to end systemic punishments for economic ability and class. So opponents argue alternative penalties for failure to send may not be as effective in decreasing rates of absenteeism as court-mandated fines. Fines are appropriate penalties or penalties because they function as effective deterrence. Sure, that's an argument, but parents are responsible for ensuring the education of their children slash youth and should be penalized for their child's youth child or youth's chronic absenteeism. These are all arguments against the bill, um, saying if parents face financial penalties, then they may be more inclined to enforce their child slash youth's attendance in school. Um, some people also say that the solution to chronic absenteeism is not to punish, or actually we're saying that the solution to chronic absenteeism is not to punish parents with court mandated monetary penalties. I would love to hear from people more about this because I do think the arguments on both sides are mm -hmm. decent arguments. I'd love to hear more. Obviously, if uh, families are already struggling financially, yeah. um, th that the, the financial penalties, but this would be something that I'd love because uh, there's definitely arguments mm -hmm. on both sides and that's why we want to show those in favor and those against it. Yep. But I want to hear from the Brockton residents and what yes. they think. This would be phenomenal for them to definitely reach out and we'll let them know how to reach out to us. Yep, contact information at the end of this podcast. At the end of this podcast, <laughs> don't let us forget. We'll, we'll give you all of that information and send it to me and let me know what you think about this bill. So next up, we have Bill H-597. It is an act to remedy disparities in students' educational achievement. So what does this bill do? It amends existing legislation in mass by replacing specified phrases with more equitable and fair dialogue concerning criteria for suspension, school policing, etc. So one example of this bill's actions is indicated in Section 4 of Bill H-597. Under Section 4, it is stated that said paragraph 1 of said section 37H and a half of said chapter 71, this is the Mass General Laws, as so appearing is hereby further amended by striking out in lines 10 to 12, inclusive the sentence, the student shall receive written notification of the charges and the reasons for such suspension prior to such suspension taking effect and inserting in place thereof the following two sentences. The student shall receive written notification of the charges and the right to a hearing before the principal. If after the hearing the principal chooses to suspend the student, the written notice of the suspension shall include the reasons for such suspension, including the basis for the principal's determination of the infliction of serious bodily injury upon another person while in school prior to such suspension taking effect. Further, any student who is placed on diversion prior to arraignment is not eligible for suspension under this section. 
So this is just one example of something that is amended in the Mass General Laws under this bill. And it would just change the dialogue and the phrasing of the specific law that's already in place to make it more inclusive and make it more, have more of a fair process. I've heard so many stories that students just quit school because they've been suspended. They just mm -hmm. didn't feel like they were treated fairly or whatever the case may have been and they just don't come back. Mm -hmm. I've heard stories of adults today that as I'm like talking to them, oh, have you ever graduated from high school? Oh no, I dropped out at senior year or junior year, whatever, because of, of got suspended, it just didn't come back. Mm -hmm. So definitely worth uh, taking a look at it. Reach out, let us know yeah. uh, how uh, these bills, all of them, you like it, don't like it, you think it should be amended, you think we should be doing more, it's not going as far enough. Whatever the case may be, definitely reach out to us and let us know. And um, the number one task that I gave you was to look at these bills through the lenses of the city of Brockton and how we directly uh, benefit and impact the community. Mm -hmm. And I think that we, we, we accomplished that. Yep. <laughs> So if we think about how these bills, all of the ones we talked about today, would help the Brockton community, they would increase educator diversity at Brock Brockton Public Schools. They would provide representation for all students in the district, not just some. They would decrease and remedy disparities in educational achievement, and they would ensure education rights and civil rights are upheld for all youth. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So definitely, I hope that people did um, find this informative and because uh, really the Brockton community deserves representation and equity under the law and I mm -hmm. do think that these bills really uh, would deliver that. And Yeah. So all students of all races and genders from all backgrounds and communities have the right to an equitable education. That's why these education bills are so important. The students of Brockton are no exception to this. Although current laws do not do everything in their power to ensure equal access to opportunity and achievement, these bills we talked about today work to fix that. Although government and law are not the most interesting subjects to everyone, they are imperative to codifying or putting into law equitable practices and procedures. Knowing your rights and knowing what your legislators are doing to better your community is a civic duty and a genuine one to ensure the betterment of individual communities as well as those on the grand scale. Absolutely. I hope that people found this amazing just as Me I too. did. And hopefully they'll reach out to you and give you a grade. <laughs> grade. Because I won't do that, but I'm hoping that... Uh, people definitely reach out to you and talk to you about your experience at the mm -hmm. State House, your experience meeting our wonderful governor mm -hmm. and working with all the amazing people in that building and attending to these hearings and looking uh, over um, more these bills. There's so many more, especially on education, so it's very hard mm -hmm. to pick the ones yep. and we're trying to keep uh, the podcast within a certain amount of time. So yes. we don't have a limited time. <laughs> But it's just been phenomenal, and I hope your experience has been just as phenomenal as it's been for me and for everybody Definitely. in our team and for the city of Brockton, the residents, and yes. And there will be more podcasts coming soon. This one is just about education bills, but we have housing, immigration, criminal justice, yes. juvenile justice, so many different things to talk about. There's Yes. So much and so little time. Yes. So I am going to give people uh, my email address so they can email it to me. Let me know what you think about um, the podcast and what you should change. So my uh, stay house email address is rita.mendez at mahouse.gov. And then my legislative aide is John Reardon. So his email address is John dot reardon at mahouse.gov. How do you spell reardon? Good question. Um, R-I-O-R-D as in David, A-N. Reardon. Okay. And then Mendez, Z or S? It, Mendez with an S. But I'll make sure that they put it on the screen. Okay, perfect. So that way it makes it easier. Hopefully, oh, we're on a podcast, so thank you. Yep. 
Um, <laughs> You'll be able to have the screen version, but we'll definitely, um, it is, yes. Awesome. What's the office phone number? Yes, the office phone number is 617-648-5673. Brockton to Beacon Hill. Oh, my office is at the State House. The room is 134, and it's an open door policy. We've talked about mm -hmm. that in the past. Yep, so there's literally no they door. They know, they know, <laughs> there's no door. So definitely, if you're at the State House, come visit us, say hello, whatever it is, we're there. And um, this is exciting. And just so everyone knows, the State House is called the People's House. Anyone can enter anytime. You don't have to show an ID. No. You go through security, but you don't have to show an ID. Definitely just come in, walk around, talk to people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's always events going on. Oh, absolutely. And they are super amazing. The, um, the events, uh, there's always food. Free food. So much free food. <laughs> free ice cream in the summer. <gasps> I haven't had that yet. You missed it, I know. <laughs> um, it's absolutely amazing. You never get bored in that building. Mm -hmm. You always have, it's wild. The day there's the animals in the building. <laughs> there's day there's agriculture. So there's lots of like people that have their farm and they're giving you samples of their cheese and honey and uh, maple syrup. And it's amazing. Yeah. We got Ag Day. Uh, what else is amazing? Uh, we got a Hall of Flags which wherever you live in Massachusetts, your flag will be in this beautiful room, mm -hmm. which I just think it's amazing. Definitely worth. You also have the tours, which are free. Yep. People can take the tours. We've done one with the students. Yes. So yes, definitely come see us at the People's House. We're there for you. I hope this people found this informative and definitely reach out to us. Mm -hmm. Let us know what you think. Let us know what bills you want us to continue to work on and push, keep on pushing. Uh, obviously, I've took the ones that I thought that for Brockton would have been at this point most beneficial. If there's other bills out there uh, in a different topics that you think it's important, send the bill numbers to me. I'll definitely take a look at it and hopefully sponsor and that's why we're there. Mm -hmm. Thank you, my child. Love. Thank you. Final words before going to law school. Um, well, pretty soon I'll be working at clinics and we'll be in DC, but I hopefully will be doing something similar to what you're doing soon. And I loved my internship and I definitely urge people to send a quick email, even just a sentence saying, please support this bill or just say your opinions. Yeah. Tell them your, your email address again. So they oh, can... I meant to you. Send you ah! an email address. Because no. <laughs> you're the representative here. You're the one who has influence and works at the state house, you know. Absolutely. They know my email address. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sounds I'm good. I'm just a soon to be law student. Yes. Good luck. Thank you. I wish you all the best. You've just been amazing it's been quite a journey mm -hmm. i had no idea what to do to you and you <laughs> just did it yourself you just excel and you took over check out her facebook and instagram <laughs> yes she said i revolutionized them yes you did absolutely um you know y'all we're always here mm -hmm. count on us and if you're on a break want to come over say hello definitely the door is always open for you mm -hmm. so exciting <laughs> thank you bye thank you